right uh we're gonna go ahead and get started now so all right thank you everyone who is joining us today welcome to the cnc webinar taming your ai ml workloads with the cube cloud the journey to the version 1.0 so my name is daniel o i'm working for red hat as a technical product marketing major as well as i'm a, a participating in cncf ambassador so today I will moderating this webinar and we'd like to welcome our awesome three presenters today. The John George Technical Read at CPSDAI at Cisco and David Aaron Chick, Head of Open Source and Machine Learning Strategy at Microsoft and Elvira Jureva, the Technical Product Major AI ML at Cisco. So we have a few things of a housekeeping item before we get started. So during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. So there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your question in the air and we will get to as many as we can at the end. So this is an official webinar of CNCF. So as such, it is subject to CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or question uh, that will be in violation of that code of conduct. So basically, uh, please be res respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. So please also note uh, the recording and slides will be posted later today to CNCF webinar, page www.cncf.io-webinars. So, uh, so I'm gonna hand it over back to Jonu, David, and Elvira. So David, uh, take it away. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you so much all community who's come together to um, hear about Kubeflow. Uh, it has been quite a journey for us, and uh, I'm really excited with the opportunity to take you through that now. So uh, I, I like to start by uh, looking back to the past. Um, uh, does anyone know what this is? Uh, normally this works a little bit better in a <laughs> conference room. But this is, in fact, the uh, SNARK maze solver and is widely credited as being the first uh, ML machine learning implementation. Uh, it came out in 1951, and it's, uh, as you can see, it's all uh, a, a hard-coded circuit. But uh, the reason I like to show this is because I want to stress how machine learning really isn't a new thing. This has been something that has been thought about uh, for a long time, about taking raw input data that you uh, don't have a clear direction on how to solve things and using that data to make predictions. Um, uh, more recently, machine learning has, uh, you know, had quite a bit of uh, acceleration. And in 2000, uh, some of the first Python libraries were added to make machine learning easier. Uh, and then in 2006, we had the advent of NumPy, then along came uh, Thanos, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Cafe, uh, DL4j, and then in 2015, we had quite an explosion of open sourced uh, machine learning frameworks, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Chainer, and so on. So uh, there have been quite a few advances from a software perspective. Uh, today we have even more, of course. Uh, and so the question is, do we need one more machine learning solution? Uh, and the answer, I would say, is yes, and the reason is, is because of quotes just like this. Uh, this is from a very sophisticated organization presented um, about two years ago uh, at Strata Data, you can see. And, and basically, what happened was the enterprise who was doing this developed the model very quickly, but then 11 months later, it still hadn't been rolled out to production. And the reason is, is because developing a model does tend to be pretty easy. You're able to get area under the curve, you have very clear metrics and things like that. But when it comes to all the other elements of machine learning, that can take quite a while. Um, this is a more recent example from the GitHub natural language search. They were able to demo in Jupyter in just two weeks. Uh, they were able to post to a front end mockup in another three days. But then three months later, uh, experiments at github.com were still going on um, because again, you know, rolling it out to production was so challenging. And, and when I say all the elements of machine learning, I'm really talking about this. On the left-hand side, you have the building of the model, 
uh, using the tools that you see there or many more. Uh, in the middle, you have some of the more um, uh, evaluation steps of the model. Uh, tracking, comparing to previous uh, rollouts, how do you do deployment, uh, how do you tune to make sure it meets your SLOs and so on. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you have more of the infrastructure layer, resource positioning, uh, dealing with your enterprise access controls and so on. And unfortunately today, uh, or, or you know, prior to Kubeflow, these things exploded into an exponential test matrix where every time you had one change in any one of the steps, uh, it required massive changing in comparison uh, all over the map. So in 2017, you can see me there on the left-hand side at KubeCon, uh, we introduced Kubeflow. And the idea behind Kubeflow was to provide a simple layer in between many of these, as well as many of the core functions that you would be looking for, so that all of those elements on the left and right-hand side could use clean, consistent, cloud-native interfaces to uh, both input, output, uh, and run common, cube, or common machine learning tasks. Uh, and at the time, I presented this slide, and I said, we want to make it easy for everyone to deploy, de uh, develop, deploy, and manage portable distributed machine learning on Kubernetes, uh, which prior to Kubeflow was challenging, and in, in fact, in many ways still is, and we can do a lot better. But the reality is, is that we just wanted to simplify it so that data scientists and machine learning engineers could really operate at the next higher level up. Uh, you know, a year later, I presented this slide to the uh, KubeCon uh, Community Summit, uh, and I presented this slide and this slide because our mission hasn't changed. It was 2018, and we still wanted to do this. In 2019, I did the exact same thing, presenting that slide, and our mission still hasn't changed. Uh, and next year, I'm gonna say the exact same thing because this is a persistent mission. We really want to make it much, much easier uh, for people to engage and use machine learning at scale. Uh, and, and when I, people say, well, why did you have to go about Kubeflow? What, what does that mission drill down into? It really looks like the following. First, we want it to be declarative. Um, uh, you know, most data scientists today will iter go on an iterative loop on their laptop and great, get great success. Unfortunately, many of the configurations and choices that they made are lost. And so when it comes to bringing those even to experimentation in the cloud, let alone uh, development, staging, and production, uh, lots of things can be lost. If you can do things in a declarative format, if you can say, hey, you know what, I'm setting up a pipeline and it requires these four services, go figure out how to roll them out using constructs in Kubernetes, that can be extremely powerful and now gives you portability to any place that Kubernetes runs, which is your local laptop, your on-prem cluster, and any hyperscale cloud. Second, we want it to be abstracted. Data scientists understand many, many things about building a model, but they don't need to understand you know, what, it needs to, uh, what needs to happen in order to get the master node to sync with the parameter nodes to sync with the worker nodes for TensorFlow, right? That's obviously quite complicated and unnecessary. They'd much rather operate at the higher level. Uh, with Kubeflow, we're giving them an abstracted layer so that all they do ha have to do is understand how to you know, interact with a notebook and then um, you know, they can hand off those problems to the framework. And finally, scalable. Um, uh, you know, a lot of machine learning takes place on single nodes today, not because those people want to, they obviously want their machine learning models to be trained and rolled out faster, but because setting up distributed training or distributed data or pipelines or things like that is very complicated. Um, if we can unlock a lot of scalability by giving people standard constructs, we should be able to do that. Uh, and I, I like to say this is a joke, but you know, only half a joke. Um, we really want to get to machine learning without the letter K. Uh, if you're a machine learning engineer or a data scientist, you should never have to even know that you're running on top of Kubeflow, let alone Kubernetes. You should interact with the tools that you are familiar with that make sense to you, but magically be given all this additional framework and tooling in order to um, have your applications uh, and, and training pipelines roll out quickly. You can see here that we've gone through uh, quite a journey 
Uh, in 2017, when we first got going, we had just three services. You can see there, Jupyter uh, TensorFlow Job, which allowed for TensorFlow distributed training and TensorFlow serving. Uh, we quickly added by May of 2018, our first pipelines, as well as uh, Selden for serving non-TensorFlow models uh, and Ambassador for our front end uh, uh, security. Um, because uh, to say the least that, that uh, Jupyter and TensorFlow serving and, and so on, were not built for a lot of enterprise requirements and being uh, surfaced to the internet. So the extent to which you could start um, uh, you know, hiding that uh, is better. Uh, then you can see we, we continue to move through January of 2019. Uh, obviously, Pipelines uh, was an enormous release there where now you can write entire workflows using nothing more than Python. Uh, it, you know, it, 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 very impressive stuff. In the middle of 20, uh, 2019, we introduced uh, KF Serving, which gave you a clean control plane for um, serving neutral uh, rollout of your models, as well as fairing allowing you to declare using metadata um, what your infrastructure should look like. Uh, 20, and then uh, through the rest of 2019, we continued to add more features, multi-user support, uh, you know, integrating more with pipelines. And finally, now in March of 2020, we are very proud to announce uh, that Kubeflow 1.0 is here. And you can see how this breaks down. At the start, we really were just trying to find the individual applications. The second was connecting the apps and pulling the metadata together, and finally, landing on productionization and hardening. Uh, we've had enormous momentum. You can see the number of uh, uh, PRs that we've had roll out, uh, commits from all over, including all of these communities and many, many more, all these companies and many more. And, and when I look at what makes a great community, I think about you know, my experience with Kubernetes. I was one of the first PMs on Kubernetes, and you saw an enormous amount of contributions, but you know, what really came down to it is, is this controlled by a single company? Um, and, and a lot of people complained about Kubernetes saying, oh, you know, it's all Google. No, it's not. In fact, more than half of the things are not Google. Um, Kubeflow looks like the same. Uh, we have obviously, a Google makes very significant contributions to this, but the majority of our contributions come from not Google. And then again, this is where we're really proud. It keeps us all honest and making sure that things work properly. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Elvira to talk about some of the elements that uh, went into Kubeflow 1.0. Thank you, David. And uh, let uh, John to switch the slides. David, can you stop sharing? Oh, yep. Sorry. Okay, uh, great. So last year we conducted a couple of user service interviews that shown us that our main target audience are mostly machine learning engineers, data scientists, and DevOps engineers. They all come from two different types of organizations, uh, big enterprise organizations with more than 5,000 people in it, as well as from small companies with less than 500 people. Interesting enough that both of these organizations are using both on-premise and cloud infrastructure for their machine learning workloads. And with this being said, that our goal, one of the our goal for Kubeflow 1.0 was to actually run uh, it on both cloud and on-premise. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So you can see that with a one simple command, kfcatl apply, now you can deploy your Kubeflow on any Kubernetes cluster, whether it's a public cloud, private cloud, or even on premise. So it's very, too, very easy to get started with uh, machine learning uh, today and uh, deploy it uh, anywhere. So can you go to the next slide, please? Right. So what is Kubeflow 1.0? With Kubeflow 1.0, we are graduating a core set of stable applications that are taken together to deliver our core crit critical user journey to develop, build, train, and deploy machine learning models on Kubernetes efficiently. The focus on 1.0 was really about to production uh, have a readiness and stability. 
So here is a set of applications that we consider production ready. You can see that uh, we have a central dashboard UI that provides a quick access to the Kubeflow components deployed in the cluster. It's a really great tool. It's a housing for UIs of the components running, uh, including pipelines, Gatib, notebooks, and many other more. And training operators include most popular training uh, frameworks such as TF operator, PyTorch operator, MPI, and XGBoost, with which you can create, manage, and run distributed jobs of, what, of that particular framework. Jupyter Notebooks are the most used Kubeflow components. Uh, this is the best way for a data scientist to develop uh, their models. With profile, con with profile controller and UI, you can manage your multi-user environment. And KF Cuddle is here for deployment and upgrades. Apart from stable components, you can also see beta components. That includes serving uh, for easily uh, serving a model in production. Uh, pipelines uh, is an end-to-end -end orchestration tool for machine learning uh, workflows. It's a really great tool. Uh, you can use it uh, to get a big, big picture of what is going on for your machine learning workloads, as well as connect all uh, steps together. Uh, CARIB uh, tool provided by Kuflo is a hyperparameter tuning tool. Uh, for data scientists, it's usually uh, very hard to find best parameters for, to get better accuracy for the model. So CARIB uh, helps data scientists to automate this process. And we also have a fairing uh, is a tool that helps uh, basically pour the code from a local environment, machine learning code from local environment to the server or to the cloud. And we also have a metadata store uh, that uh, stores all artifacts collected from the experiments and the model development. So you can uh, easily come back and uh, track whatever you changed in, in the last time. Okay, let's go through the critical user joining. Uh, here you can see uh, two users, uh, both data scientists, uh, Bob and Liz. Both of them have access to their personal uh, notebook server with different types of Jupyter notebooks that they have created uh, for variety of machine learning uh, uh, model de uh, developments. And the cool thing is that uh, only Bob uh, has access to his notebooks and Liz has access only to his uh, notebooks stored in the Liz namespace. But what if they want to work both on the same model uh, on the same data set? In this case, they can have a shared namespace where they both have access to the variety of notebooks and now they can collaborate together. Uh, so next slide, yes. So once machine learning a model uh, was developed, uh, there is a code source available to it, but usually how it happens, a data scientist developed this code on his local machine, but now he wants to train on the server. And uh, in most cases, this is a manual uh, operation when a data scientist need to manually port his code to the machine. That includes uh, the knowledge of the infrastructure, uh, the need to create images all the time manually. So in, to, in order to reduce uh, these complex uh, steps, uh, Kuflow uh, provides Fairing uh, is a great tool that basically takes your machine learning code, uh, put it, build an image for you automatically and port it to the server or to the cloud. And in the next step, uh, once you have a code uh, ready on the server, we can go to the training step. And here, before you start training, as I said, you might want to have your hyperparameter tuned. So you, you might want to use Kuflo, uh, Katib uh, to find best parameters for your model. And once these parameters are set, you can run either on a single run your, your machine learning uh, training, or you can do it on a distributed way. 
with multiple GPUs. And as I said, we ran a couple of user surveys and we asked like what are most used frameworks in your company. And it appears that TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost are one of the most used uh, frameworks as well as Scikit-Learn. And they are all available in Kuflow. And the last step is a deploy step. It's a, the step where you actually have a model ready and now you want to deploy it to have available on production. So, and Kuflow provides this capability with KF Serving. KF Serving uh, is a custom resource on top of Knative. It actually uh, really helps uh, for both data scientists and IT operators or DevOps engineers to put your model in production because it helps uh, to hide the complexity of Kubernetes and Knative. You don't need to know much about it. On the right hand side, you can see uh, configuration files. And the cool thing about it that you don't need to do a lot of things. Uh, with this simple configuration file, you just only need to specify the framework you use, like scikit-learn on TensorFlow, and point to the storage where your current model is stored. And if you, have diff if you use different frameworks, you only change these two lines of code, and you don't see the whole complexity of Kubernetes or any infrastructure layer. And for IT operator and DevOps engineers, this is also a cool thing with additional advanced features that helps to um, manage GPUs, do automated scaling based on load, and do deployments and rollouts. And on this note, I'd like Jonu to give some demo about Kuflow. Thanks, Alura. Uh, okay. Um, so this is a Qflow dashboard, which is deployed with latest stable 1.2 release manifest. Um, so uh, this is a standard installation with all the components, default components are there. So I'll have a brief walkthrough through this. Um, so on the left, um, you would see the KF pipelines, which, with which you can actually create end-to-end -end machine learning workflows, uh, notebook servers, which can be used to create Jupyter notebooks, uh, CATIP, which is a scalable hyperparameter tuning server, which is already discussed, and the artifact store uh, for storing various uh, machine learning artifacts. So there are many other components like KF serving, uh, as discussed earlier, um, for serving machine learning models, uh, distributed operators like PF operator, PyTorch operator, MPI operator, and uh, XGBoost operator, which can be invoked via SDK or standard Kubernetes client tools. Um, they don't have any specific dashboard right now. Now let's actually uh, start with a data scientist perspective of things. So for a data scientist, he has a problem statement and he wants to experiment various solutions uh, try building various machine learning models, find the best model, and then later put that into production. So he is not aware of any underlying uh, infrastructure. So the question is, how does Kubeflow help here? Um, so as we know, data scientists they are comfortable with Jupyter notebooks. So here we have already created uh, notebook servers for you. Um, I'll just have a, a quick walkthrough on the possible options in each of the notebook server configuration. So here um, you could specify custom image uh, if required, else you could actually use the built-in uh, TensorFlow images for the various versions. Uh, you could specify CPU and memory requirements. Uh, also, you could add GPUs uh, if you need them. Or also, if you need persistent storage for long-term storage, you could add, add them too, and then just click launch. So you have, um, um, a separate notebook server for you. Now, once notebook server is created, um, just click on connect, and this will take you to the Jupyter notebook interface. And I've created a sample uh, notebook for you. Um, let's actually 
go to that and right so here let's talk about one interesting use case here um, what we have taken is an indoor localization problem um, so the objective is to accurately locate a person in the building based on various uh, measurements so consider this this was a Kaggle competition and this data set is created using bluetooth low energy BLE rssi readings of 13 beacons uh, located on different parts of the floor uh, in a library so data was collected using uh, uh, using a phone and um, so here this rssi measurements are negative so the bigger measure, larger measurements means closer proximity to beacon so so data looks like something like this so you have uh, the input columns to be rssi readings of 13 beacons corresponding to each of the columns and the output uh, column is the location which is the grid number so for example p01 is the first grid uh, in the pth column so now, so once the problem statement is given, uh, the data scientist wants to try out this problem. So using Jupyter Notebook, he could um, start the, uh, the pre-processing part. Um, so that, that would include data cleaning to remove the, the columns that are not needed. Um, then uh, he could normalize data. Then once the initial pre-processing pre part is done, he would think about the model uh, to, to be used in this. So here we have used the uh, base model which was given in the Kaggle competition, uh, which was a DNN classifier. Now, when it comes to neural network, the one another question that comes to uh, mind of a data scientist would be, how do I find out the hyperparameters for my neural network? So for uh, people who, who are not uh, uh, familiar with hyperparameters, they are parameters which are set outside the actual model training, uh, which are, the, those are the fixed values, right? So for example, in case of neural network, the learning rate, momentum rate, et cetera. So how does Kubeflow help you there? So here it provides a component called CATIP, which, is, uh, which takes care of your hyperparameter hyper tuning process. Um, so let's see that how it works. So here, in the main dashboard, there is a, a CATIP option. There, just go and click on Submit uh, for hyperparameter tuner. Um, here, this is a sample form in order to start a simple hyperparameter tuning process. Um, so it basically has four major sections. One is objective, second one is algorithm, parameters, and then the trial spec. So the objective specifies whether I have to maximize or minimize a particular objective metric name, which can be, for example, here it is accuracy or it can be a loss function and the final goal uh, that we have to reach. Um, the second one is the algorithm which we have to use for hyperparameter tuning. It can be a random grid hyperplan Bayesian optimization. Those are provided by default in Kubeflow CATIP. We could add initial settings for the algorithm if needed. Then the third section is about adding parameters, uh, which we have to tune. So this lists down each of the parameters and their corresponding parameter type, whether it is double, indoor, categorical, um, and corresponding to that, what is the feasible space, minimum, maximum, and if it is categorical, how much, uh, what are the list items? And finally, uh, we specify the image or the real training goal to be optimized. So we have done this uh, before, since it takes like uh, more than five minutes, we have done this before. And this is one, ex uh, the exactly same code which we have uh, done hyperparameter tuning on uh, process on top of it. So let's see the experiment settings that we have done for this. Uh, so as discussed, we have used uh, the objective metric name to be L2 loss. So since it's a loss function, it has to be minimized. And the parameters that we are tuning is the learning rate and the beta one, and the corresponding uh, feasible space is provided. And we have provided the trial template, which specifies the image to be tuned um, uh, in the process, which is the, the, the image corresponding to the code that we have. So once it is completed, it lists down the, the best trial that we have got. Uh, and the corresponding parameter assignments and the L2 loss value. 
and this is the minimal value across all the uh, uh, all the trials that we have got. Um, so here we have a, a visual interface too. So here you could see that the leftmost column is the L2 loss, which is the object geometric name, and the corresponding two different hyperparameters which are tuned. Uh, so for each uh, combination, you'll have a L2 loss value. So there are 18 trials which are done, and the least one was the uh, the first trial uh, with 2.07 as the L2 loss and corresponding learning rate and the beta one. So just to demonstrate the power of hyperparameter tuning, this these results basically beat the existing Kaggle mo model by 20% with just five minutes of training. Um, now let's go back to the our classification code. So what we have got the best hyperparameter values, right? So we said that, and now um, the model classifier is specified. The exporter, uh, the training and the evaluation spec uh, is specified. And then the evaluation spec should contain the, uh, the exporter function, which specifies where exactly the model is stored. And uh, finally, the estimator train and evaluate functions uh, called from there. Now, um, so here one important thing to be noted is we use estimate a class train and evaluate function to enable model export and saving. So the advantage is that there is no code change if you want to run this in this local mode or in the, late, in, in the future if you want to move it to a distributed setup. So as discussed earlier, we could use the Qflow pairing component to wrap the, uh, the notebook code and run in a distributed manner in any uh, remote Kubernetes cluster. It can be on-prem or it can be on cloud. So here, Kubeflow operators come in handy um, in order to set all the required distributed configs automatically for you in the case of distributed setup. So for example, in case of TensorFlow, uh, if you want to run a distributed job, you have to set PF config or in PyTorch, you have to set the rank for each of the nodes. So these things are automatically done by the distributor operators that we have in Kubeflow. Uh, so we just need to move it to distributed uh, setup and run this exactly same code, and you basically get a scaled up setup. So all work as a magic when we are moving from local to remote. So for now, we skip the fairing part. Since it takes little time, we will try to cover it at the end. So we start the training. And once training is done, um, here we, uh, we just list down the values which we have got from the hyperparameter tuning process. So once we have done the training, now a data scientist wants to try sending some sample prediction uh, custom inputs. So how can Qflow help here? So with, with, uh, as discussed earlier, like with a si uh, simple chaos serving config, model can be deployed. It just needs parameters, uh, for the model storage location as well as the uh, that uh, the framework type TensorFlow, and one uh, you, uh, just apply that, and we just need to wait for the port to come up, serving port to come up, model deployment, and once model is deployed, uh, the URL the, which is the route URL is aut automatically created, and this serves as the um, the end prediction endpoint. So now it, once we have the prediction endpoint, you could send uh, custom inputs to see the, uh, to see our prediction. Uh, so as in uh, like he could send different values for uh, RSSI measurement values for uh, each of the sensors and that happens to be the custom input and um, like as a result we get which class ID it belongs to which is the uh, which corresponds to the corresponding grid location. So it is the 13th grid location uh, which is predicted and the corresponding uh, highest probability value for that. So till now we have um, talked about like one complete local training with a hyperparameter tuning and then local deployment, right? Now, once this is verified, data scientist can, wants to uh, move this into production, right? Like, so how can you do that? So the same code can be packaged, built and uploaded to remote repository um, it can be a Docker repository or GCS or in Azure, uh, start training and serve it from there, like using pairing uh, li library. So here, um, just to show about it, like um, this, uh, since the building takes time, I'm not going through the, uh, the actual building process, but here 
you could see like in a single uh, using the simple pairing SDK, uh, which specifies the actual training job. And once it is submitted, the image is built and the deployment process is started uh, in the remote cluster. Uh, and once the training is completed, using pairing itself, endpoint can be created and we can do exactly the same, uh, the, the prediction uh, example that we have done uh, in the remote, from the remote cluster. So scaling up from local deployment to the remote deployment is kind of like in just three lines of code using pairing like here. Yeah, so the, uh, this covers the um, basic uh, journey of a data scientist from uh, actual training, the local training to the final produ uh, production ready cluster. Um, so uh, Elvira, want to take from there? Yes, sure. Right, so all this would be nothing without feedback from our users and collaborations. We're really glad to see that Kubeflow uh, helps uh, these days to manage machine learning workflows at scale. And uh, you can read these uh, nice quotes and feedbacks from our users. And now, uh, what is next? Uh, if you go, if you can go to the next slide, yes. What is next? So you saw a different variety of Kubeflow components, and as I said, we have beta components that currently uh, we're working on to have them eventually also ready for production. This includes pipelines, uh, tool for orchestrating uh, complex machine learning workflows, metadata, CATIP, and many other components that are still in beta. And of course, enterprise readiness. That involves a, a lot of work on security and vulnerability. Uh, so we already started working toward these action items. And of course, uh, managing Kubeflow Upgrades uh, is a main topic too. And uh, you can now see these different uh, sources. Uh, you can go to the Kubeflow website. You can use uh, the next link uh, to run the demo yourself. And I also ask you to please take the survey. And uh, survey results really help us to develop and prioritize features in Kubeflow. We really listen to our users. And you also saw some user survey results and I constantly update them once we have enough respondents. So please take it. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining today. And now we open for questions and answer sessions. You can uh, post them in our Q&A box. Thank you very much again. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Jonu, David, and Elvira for the great presentation and a really awesome demo. So we now have some time for questions. If you have any question you would like to ask, please drop it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and we will get as many as we can have time for that. So actually we have uh, uh, six questions and three questions already, and uh, two questions is already answered. And uh, uh, the next question I can see I here. I think we can go through all questions, including that we all already answered, just in case other people would like to know. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, first question, uh, David, you already uh, added some command and why we decided to invest your effort in a key app serving rather than have things out then. What are the future of a serving on Qflow? So David, uh, can you add, answer a little bit more about that? Uh, I mean, you can see it all right there. The, the net is that KF serving is just a, a, an abstraction interface and it doesn't in any way uh, handle the serving itself. It, it relies on underlying servers to do that. So uh, because what we heard from the community is that people want maximum answers uh, and choice when it comes to the actual server using their, um, their, for their particular solution. And so now uh, with a single interface, you're able to interact with Selden, Triton, 
TF serving, hyperscale serving options, you know, you name it. Got it. Thank you. And next question we already uh, had answered. How the, sh the shared notebook feature coming along? For example, as a modeler, uh, can I share the notebook server with another user or group or even team? So answer was typically you create a shared namespace where you can add users so they will have access to all notebook server in that namespace. Uh, any another comment? Avira? Yes, so um, so he will have access to all the notebook servers uh, in that particular namespace, yes. All right, perfect. So next question, what is the direction for managing Qflow without being a cluster admin? Um, so how it happens is uh, like a cluster admin adds users and users are given uh, a separate namespace. So after that, it is kind of autopilot. So cluster admin doesn't need to um, worry anything about what uh, the individual users try to do. All right, cool. Thanks for that. And next one is uh, probably I missed this part, but how hyperparameter from the hyperparameter tuning are injected into the notebook? Um, so here, uh, like in the demo, I just used shell command, but um, th there is a Python SDK for catip. So which means you could programmatically uh, pick values from uh, the output that we have from the catip experiment and then directly inject, in, uh, inject into the notebook, uh, whatever code that you have. Okay, thanks. So next question from Harry, uh, will the notebook in the demo will be, will be made available? Uh, something like a Gilead Paul, uh, anyone can access and replicate. Yes, uh, right. So uh, you can use uh, the link that I posted uh, here on the slide, the demo source. You can find these notebooks and many other notebooks under that link. Um, yeah, and you can use it. Yeah, nice. Perfect. I love it. So next question, is there a notion of doing things interactively using Eclipse Chat or VS Code rather than doing this in a via notebook or jobs? Um, so I have seen uh, like very similar issues in GitHub. Uh, but I'm actually not sure about the progress about it. I've seen people asking for it. Um, we would ideally like to have community contributions for that. Uh, uh, I can track the changes uh, and the updates happening to that PR. So I'm not currently not uh, uh, updated on that. Yeah, one, one thing that we should uh, stress, um, uh, you know, I, I would say one, one thing we've really tried to do is, is uh, not just what Kubeflow is good at, but what it's not good at. And, and though certainly we offer an interactive experience in Kubeflow, uh, we do expect the vast majority of people to continue using whatever IDEs and tooling uh, they're familiar with um, uh, when it comes to doing the production, so for experimentation and so on. Um, in this particular case, our recommendation um, would probably be to use a standard uh, GitOps or MLOps pipeline, uh, code in the language that, that makes sense to you and explore uh, locally. Uh, and that includes, uh, you know, VS Code or Eclipse Chi or, or whatever you like. Uh, and then and then check those those uh, tools or excuse me check those artifacts in. Um, and that really is a best practice. Though, though we offer Jupiter as a, a way of hosting, um, you know I, I wouldn't say that that solves uh, all all solutions. Nor would I expect us to figure out how to do that. Uh, that said, we're always willing to take um, additional you know plugins. There should be a VS Code extension and so on. Um, and and we'd really love to do that. Thanks, David and Jono. So next question is there any plans to support the Gen Theme in the future? Um, again, I'm not aware of that, uh, but like given the composability nature, uh, I don't think there is any problem to support it in the future. Uh, but I don't see any particular effort currently um, on, that, on that particular point. Okay, um, if, cool. if you don't mind, I, I'd love to hear what um, what you'd like to see uh, supported. I, I agree I'll ultimately with uh, John Yu. Um, uh, the, the extensibility of Kubeflow is such that you can basically build any package you want and add it as a, a pipeline component or whatever you like. Uh, but I'd love to hear, you know, maybe we can do it offline. 
um, uh, just email us. You can see all, all our email addresses down there. What you're looking for support, or or better yet, uh, file an issue in Kubeflow and uh, and let us know about it and, and uh, mail to Kubeflow Discuss. All right. Yeah, send it to directly. Okay, uh, so one of the pain point we have in production uh, pre and post processing of data during interface. So does your Kubeflow help with it? If yes, how? Um, so here, uh, like in V1 Alpha 2 version of KL Serving, it actually supports that. Uh, so there is a pre-processor and a pro post-processor. So in the example that we have done, we have just done the prediction part. But there is an option currently uh, in the current version to have a pre-processor and post-processor of the data. Uh, and based on that, like based on your user needs, it is possible to do it. Okay, thanks to and you. And yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, again, this is another area where I would probably expect uh, the underlying serving tool to take care of the work more than than uh, things um, you know at the Kubeflow layer. That said, uh, you shouldn't look at KF serving for um, uh, the 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 uh, interfaces they use to allow for uh, uh, to declare what pre and post processing you need. All right, cool. So next question from uh, Jeffrey. How does version management code fit into this flow in terms of the reproducibility? For example, all the Python code in a notebook? Um, uh, so I would say uh, like, uh, for example, in the case of like using pairing, you could actually build uh, the, uh, the entire code to image and then it actually becomes immutable. So, um, so that is definitely possible, and ultimately, uh, the files, the uh, what the training code that you have can be versioned um, uh, like using the same manner that we actually do for um, the 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 normal uh, training process. So that is possible. Yeah, I, and and again, let me let me stress. I I think the best organizations in the world solve this. Um, you know, I I know I'm highly biased here, but solve this using uh, things like GitOps and GitHub Actions um, as your CI CD. And so what would happen is a data scientist would iterate on their inner loop on their laptop or on their private uh, uh, cluster um, and, and continue to iterate. And then once they were done, they would commit mm -hmm. that into um, uh, you know, a, a GitHub repo. And in that GitHub repo, you would, you would build a set of actions that would process that into a production ready uh, or training ready or, or some, some similar thing where things could now be distributed at scale. So using something like NB Dime or um, uh, other automated tools to, to strip out and clean and, and so on. But, but by making Git the center point, the source of truth for everything, you, you know, we are not trying to reinvent the wheel when it comes to all the details around merge conflicts and, and uh, you know, single source of truth and immutable data structures and tracking over time and things like that. All right, perfect. So uh, this question from Dimitri, as I know, KF serving based on Knave, but Knave Python support is not very good because Knave developers are focusing on Golang. So do you have any plans to contribute for better Python support for Knative? Okay, so uh, this looks a uh, little out of context here, but again, like uh, happy to hear like uh, if you have any particular use case which is not supported, um, we we could chat offline to see um, what uh, if you have like a different set of requirements for you. Yeah, um, I, I just to follow on exactly what he said. Um, uh, you know, let us know what what's working um, or, or not working. Uh, just to show you. Um, if you just go to, you know, the KF serving repo, you can see the, uh, I can, I can show you in a screen share or, or whatever, but you can see the stacks are basically completely flexible. So, you know, at that top layer, you should be able to uh, declare just about any framework you like, uh, throw it in a container, and then everything else should cascade down. So uh, if that doesn't work, then that's absolutely a bug. And um, you should mail out to, you know, you should file a bug in the, KF uh, serving um, it, uh, uh, issues in GitHub, uh, and you should mail out to to uh, you know KF discuss or or excuse me um, uh, Kubeflow discuss, and um, 
and uh, you know add into the Slack and so on. Uh, but but there's nothing about Python that that um, should slow anything here. Um, let us know what you want. I mean, you can see right there in the repo, uh, you know, PyTorch is up there, um, XGBoost, which is obviously Python based, and and so on. And uh, you know, Scikit-Learn. Cool. So next question, I'm doing some actually computing implementation. Has anyone done any Qflow or Raspberry Pis? Uh, boy, I, I haven't heard of it. There's absolutely, because all we require is a conformant Kubernetes cluster, there's nothing preventing you to, from, um, from doing that. Uh, what I would recommend, however, is um, it, it's really about building that last pipeline step and thinking about how you do a distribution of your model. And in that particular case, I would actually strongly recommend if you can to use uh, either a service that you built yourself uh, using one of the IoT frameworks out there or ideally a hosted IoT framework. Um, a distribution of models across edge devices um, is a particularly challenging problem. Uh, loose connections, uh, irregular updates, uh, uh, low bandwidth and things like that. And uh, there are many, many problems that you can run into. So if you go out and use whatever, you know, um, uh, Azure IoT or, or uh, Google IoT or, or uh, you know, Greengrass from, from uh, Amazon, whatever it might be, and, and build that into a pipeline step, but then ultimately use their service, that would be the recommended path. Uh, you just, you're going to, you're going to run into a lot of problems that have been uh, discovered and and um, and figured out. Great. Uh, another question is: Is it good practice separate training Qflow and the serving in the two separate clusters? Um, generally speaking, yes, uh, because the uptime requirements are uh, quite significantly different. Uh, you know, if a training cluster goes down, it's fairly easy to just flatten it and restart. If the serving cluster goes down, you're, you're in for a world of hurt. Um, uh, the general best practice in cloud native, in the cloud native world is to install only what you need on uh, the, the clusters that you need and then s use um, anytime you have a, a blast radius change or any kind of latency or other requirement change uh, to have a different cluster that is specific to that. So in this particular case, what you'd do is you'd, you'd build two, um, you know, Kubeflow clusters side by side and one, you would install your training uh, and potentially serving, I mean, like as a, you know, uh, if you want to do smoke testing and then the other, you would install Kubeflow and training only, or excuse me, and, and uh, serving only. And then you would communicate between them. Uh, you are getting into new problems, of course, how you're going to deal with like sharing credentials and things like that. But that's, a, those are solved problems through things like Vault and, and uh, so on. Thanks, David. And I think the last question is uh, uh, related to the above one. The, for example, eventing in Python are supporting and scale from zero. Any other, other comment? Um, that, that is an interesting uh, problem. So you, you want to, uh, I, I'm going to have to like uh, plead ignorance as to know exactly what the issue you're running into. Um, I appreciate you following up. Please uh, drop this in, in Kubeflow discuss, or better yet, uh, you know, like I said, uh, uh, an issue in the KF serving repo, and the right people will look at it. Perfect. All right. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, John Yu, David, and Elvada for the great presentation and awesome demo. It was uh, really practical. So, all right. Uh, these are all the questions that we have a time for today. So thanks for joining again us today and uh, the webinar recording and slides that will be online later today. So we are looking forward to seeing you at future CNC webinar. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.